On a warm June day in 1991, with cameras rolling and a crowd watching, President Zachary Taylor's body was removed from its limestone mausoleum in Louisville, Kentucky. They were about to test, nearly 150 years after his death, whether the conspiracy theories were right and he had actually been poisoned. If so, he would be the first president assassinated in American history. I'm Lillian Cunningham with The Washington Post, and this is the 12th episode of Presidential. Shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. What your country can do for you. A date which will live in infamy. Zachary Taylor was born in Virginia, like so many other presidents we've had up until this point. He was born there in November of 1784, which means he was four years old when George Washington became president, and he was 12 years old when George Washington left the presidency. Just imagine what your view of America would be like if this is the time you grow up in. Though he was born in Virginia, his family was one of the many families that moved westward as the country was expanding. So most of his childhood was spent on the Kentucky frontier. He was one of eight children, and at first his family lived in this really small cabin in the woods. They were planters, though, and eventually his father did quite well, well enough that he acquired more and more land, built the cabin into a real house, and ended up having close to 30 slaves. Zachary Taylor had a decent education, but he was never a great student. He was always interested in military service, though. So when he was about 23 years old, he became an officer in the Army. And the way that he got this Army commission is that, small world, his cousin was James Madison, who at the time was serving as Secretary of State. So to help me explore Zachary Taylor's personality, leadership style, and presidency for this episode, I called Catherine Clinton. Catherine Clinton reporting in on Zachary Taylor. She's a historian, a biographer, and a professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio. You know, if I knew nothing about him and I were being set up on a blind date with him or about to go into a room and, and meet him for the first time, how would you describe him, both physically, but also, you know, his mannerisms and his character? Sure. I I think people are a bit surprised to find out how unexceptional Zachary Taylor was. Although he was a military hero, he didn't seem to have that bearing. He wasn't commanding as a young child. And nevertheless, he seemed to impress people with his efficiency, with his integrity. Indeed, his integrity was so great that during the campaign and into his presidency, he was referred to as naive by so many. He had a kind of integrity that was mistaken for really uh, ineptitude. He was a rather taciturn man and not easy to get to know. He had few close friends. He wasn't a hail fellow well met, but he was someone who delivered the goods in the military. Taylor spends about 40 years serving in the military. Most of the early battles he's fighting involve the Native Americans in areas like present-day Wisconsin, Oklahoma, Mississippi, Louisiana. These are all areas that are still essentially wilderness at the time. But interestingly, he's not always fighting against Native Americans. In many cases, he's actually charged with preventing white settlers from invading their territory and starting conflicts. The way that he becomes a popular national figure, though, is that when he's about 60 years old, he's a military leader in the Mexican War. If you listen to the last episode, you might remember that President Polk essentially sparks a war against Mexico in 1846 by ordering Zachary Taylor to lead U.S. troops into disputed territory along the Texas and Mexico border. Polk does this so he can make a big land grab for the United States. 
And the war itself is not really popular among the American public. But Taylor wins key battles that lead to U.S. victory. And these stories emerge of how he's this incredible general who fights right alongside the soldiers in order to win these battles. Like all American wars, even though you might have fraught feelings about the politics of the war, certainly the fact that he had led such courageous stands against the enemy at Buena Vista, at Monterey, he made it into the headlines and made it in as a military hero. And we do know that in American politics, certainly a military hero is a great thing. It, he was such a well-known figure that actually a satirical magazine, Yankee Doodle, had a series of sketches about old Zack. And this satire, uh, we now know, was penned, although anonymously at the time, it was Herman Melville. It was a satirization that put him in the spotlight. Because he suddenly has all this name recognition as a big war hero, both political parties at the time, so this is the Whigs and the Democrats, They both start courting him to run as their presidential candidate in the upcoming 1848 election. But here's the thing, neither party actually has any idea what Zachary Taylor believes. Because not only has he never been involved in politics, but he's never even voted in his entire life. So that was taken that he was apolitical, whereas in reality, he believed that he is an army officer, had a duty to serve as commander in chief, and he never wanted to serve under someone who he had voted against. So I think that shows, in some ways, the strength of his character. Could you tell me a little bit more about how he does actually end up on the presidential ticket? I mean, to what extent he he wants that versus he's, you know, sort of pressured into it? Just how that sure. unfolds. It, it's- Certainly, it's clear that he didn't seek this higher office. As a matter of fact, we know that when the Whig Party finally decided to deliver to him this invitation to be the candidate, uh, it came in the form of a letter. And they were waiting for his response, and they were waiting for weeks and weeks, because it turned out that Taylor was so frugal that he told the local postmaster not to deliver mail unless it had been paid for. So it was a long time before he got their invitation and before he took it, because he had said many times that he was not interested in being a representative of the party. He was interested in being a representative of the nation, and he wouldn't want to play party politics. But eventually he says yes to the Whig Party's invitation, which is somewhat interesting because remember that this is the party that's more northern, more against slavery, It's for a stronger federal government. And Taylor has more southern roots, for sure, but he sees himself above all as a nationalist who's very much for a united country and is against any southern talk of secession, which is why he does eventually say yes to being on the Whigs' ticket. When Zachary Taylor was finally persuaded to run for office. It was to the great chagrin of his wife, who was extremely religious. She didn't want the attention. We have to remember um, the press could be quite unkind to women it didn't like. She did not sign up for being a political wife. Indeed, she prayed that he would lose the election. Yet, of course, he won. He beat Lewis Cass, the Democratic nominee, and he beat former President Martin Van Buren, who was running at the time for the Free Soil Party. The election took place on November 7th, 1848, and this is the first time in history that all Americans went to the polls to vote on the same day. One big reason that Taylor wins is that, just as the party leaders predicted, his lack of clear political opinions gave many voters the hope that he would ultimately side with them, whether or not that was correct. It is this military leadership quality, the notion that he was above party, that allowed him to really 
conquer both north and south. And it's a pattern, I think, that's repeated. It's quite striking. I was struck by the way in which Dwight Eisenhower was embraced by both parties upon his return, and much was projected on him. And he had to deal with the issues of civil rights, and people could could ascribe values to him which he may or may not have held. And this was very true of someone like Zachary Taylor. A fun factoid about Taylor's inauguration in March of 1849 is that because he's quite religious, he actually refused to take the oath of office on a Sunday, which meant that there ended up being about a 24-hour gap between when James Polk left office and when Taylor took office, during which technically there's no real president. But let's zoom out. So here's some of what's going on at the time that Taylor becomes president. For one thing, women are getting more involved in fighting for political rights, both their own, but also very involved in the anti-slavery movement. The popular writers at the time are people like poet Edgar Allan Poe in the U.S., Charles Dickens in Britain, Fyodor Dostoevsky in Russia. And then in terms of geography, because of the Mexican War, the United States now has all this new land that's been outed in the south and the western parts of the country. And particularly important as Taylor becomes president is that gold has just been discovered in California. And this not only sparks the California gold rush, but it makes the question of whether California should enter as a free state an even more intense topic. In his inaugural address, he said that the Constitution should be obeyed and politicians should abstain from the introduction of exciting topics. Well, with the gold discovery in California and the 49ers, that really wasn't going to happen. Party politics was quite combustible and contentious during this period. And, for example, in 1849, it took 60 ballots, three weeks, to get a Speaker of the House. I think when we talk about the division in politics contemporarily in the 21st century, we need to look back and see just how contentious it was. The North and South are basically fighting over the economic destiny of America, namely whether the country's economic future should hinge on agriculture, which ends up meaning, of course, slavery, or whether the country should be encouraging and betting on other industries for its economic prosperity. When it comes to the issue of slavery, Taylor is again trying to rise above sectional differences. He is himself a slave owner. He has more than 80 slaves on his Louisiana plantation. But as president, he doesn't push for the expansion of slavery. In fact, he thinks the best way forward is for California to join the Union immediately as a free state. This sets him in direct opposition to pro-Southern, pro-slavery factions of Congress, including his own son-in-law, Jefferson Davis, who's a Democratic congressman at the time and who helped win the presidency for Taylor. So it was this great personal drama that he was at long last president, he'd been reconciled with Jefferson Davis, yet Davis was part of this faction that was pushing, pushing, pushing for slavery. And it was something that he was very angry about. He didn't know how to handle these kind of conflicts. As a result, the Congress ends up sorting through its own plan, which comes to be called the Compromise of 1850, in which... There are a lot of concessions being made to the pro-slavery factions in Congress. The great orators of the day, Daniel Webster, William Seward, John C. Calhoun, all contributed to this debate. Actually, Calhoun died shortly after his very moving endorsement. And uh, so it was a great, great disappointment to Taylor that he could not convince Congress to move forward with his idea, which was to bring California in as a free state above all. And he was not used to the give and take. He was not used to the backroom politics that went on in pushing legislature through on Capitol Hill. This may highlight one potential downside to having a military leader in the White House. Taylor himself espoused a theory that he could be magistrate in chief. He believed that his loyalty could be to America, which it was as a military man. He had the opportunity, many political observers thought, of bringing the nation together. 
But because he had not been schooled in politics, because he was not a politician, many also argue that he squandered this opportunity. Um, What do you think the leadership lesson is there? I mean, does it tell us military leaders don't quite have everything we need in order for them to be effective well, presidents? Well, as a military leader, I think he thought that he he could command and people would obey. And this was something that he was one of the presidents who most alienated Congress during his his time in office. Um, Whigs wanted to restore the protective tariff of 1842. He would hear none of it. His views on banking, internal improvements did not go along with party politics. He thought he could ignore party politics. And he wanted his cabinet to re- to reflect the nation's diverse interests so he would avoid choosing prominent Whigs. He did not play the game. So I think being a military man, he had not had been isolated in many ways from congressional uh, grappling. He um, was unwilling really to take on some of the border questions, the Texas-Mexico border and the Utah question that went forward. He was particularly unskilled in terms of his international view of things. During his short time in office, there was very little that he accomplished in terms of foreign policy, only a um, a treaty to have an interoceanic canal through Central America. So he did he did have some vision of his role as magistrate, but he didn't have uh, any idea about what it would take to massage politics into his vision, his will. And as a result, he wrote complaining letters to friends about the way in which he was being mistreated by former friends. He, he was a man who believed in loyalty, and he was quite shocked and surprised when politics took a front seat and loyalty took a back seat during his administration. What do you think is worth remembering about Taylor? Any way in which it is worth sort of looking back at his time in office and remembering something from it? Well, I think that Taylor tried to rise above the politics of his era, but found it was a vortex that he was pulled into, whether he liked it or not. It's true that he was someone who tried to compromise, tried to hold the course, but he didn't do it with a statesman's voice. He tried to do it with a military voice, commanding and demanding that Congress accede to his wishes. So we do see that perhaps the military demeanor is not one that holds great sway in White House politics in the 19th century and perhaps into the future. We don't get to see how Taylor's leadership style would have ultimately played out because he dies only a year and a half into office. On July 4, 1850, he spent Independence Day at celebrations in Washington, D.C., and then falls violently ill. At the time, some think it's from rotten cherries or spoiled milk that he had at the festivities. Well, five days later, he dies and an estimated 100,000 people crowded the streets of D.C. to watch his funeral procession. His vice president, the New Yorker Millard Fillmore, stepped into the presidency. Certainly, this kind of thing was a shock to people, to having the president dead, and yet it also meant that very quickly there was a new political force in town because the New Yorker Millard Fillmore, who had been quite annoyed early in the campaign when he felt he didn't have the presidential candidate's full support, was someone who was perfectly ready to step into the role. He swept his cabinet clean. He replaced wholly every Taylor appointment, which is the first time in American history that's ever happened. Many um, scholars have commented that this um, death of of a fairly uh, innocuous, uh, not very politically astute president was something that might have 
uh, for, set the course for the nation for uh, the war looming on the horizon and might have actually accelerated the war. How soon after he died were there rumors about whether it was an assassination? Well, almost immediately, uh, there were, of course, conspiracy theories. When the president fell ill and died a few days later, there were those who suggested that he might have been poisoned by pro-slavery Southerners who were uh, upset about his position on California. And these theories really um, swirled about him. They died down. But in um, the 1970s, you had people saying that uh, because the removal of Taylor from office and putting Fillmore in tilted the country in one political direction. Maybe his death was something wished on him by enemies who carried out their plots. By 1991, the theory that perhaps Zachary Taylor was our first assassinated president had reached its peak. A historical novelist in Florida named Clara Rising convinced Taylor's living descendants to agree to have his body exhumed. The exhumation and medical tests made headlines. They were testing in particular for arsenic poisoning. But ultimately, the medical examiner's conclusion was, nope, not poisoned, likely just some form of gastroenteritis, which was caused, like in Harrison's death in the White House and Polk's death shortly after the White House, by a contaminated White House water supply that was carrying all kinds of horrible diseases. There's always been this strain of people who uh, uh, believe in uh, conspiracy theories. You know, you're talking about President Taylor, but obviously the modern one is, you know, 1963, the grassy knoll. That's Dana Milbank, an opinion columnist at the Washington Post. No presidential conspiracy theories have been quite so pervasive as John F. Kennedy's assassination. But even today, Dana finds himself thinking about and writing about presidential conspiracy theories with a surprising frequency, whether it's truthers questioning 9-11 or birthers questioning Obama's birth certificate. There are a lot of parallels being drawn uh, between these times and the times leading up to the Civil War. Now, you know, God forbid, that's what we're 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 leading towards. Uh, I think what you have is a, a, a an unhappy, an angry, uh, a disaffected uh, public, and I think w- when you have that, you have this, uh, and you have your politics polarized the way they are. There is a tendency and an eagerness to demonize uh, opponents. Through this lens, it perhaps becomes a bit clearer why assassination theories would have swirled around Taylor soon after his death. There is such distrust and animosity building between the different factions of the country. I asked Dana if he thinks that conspiracy theory is really one major sign of a fractured public, or if there's anything, anything at all positive that conspiracy theories can in some way contribute to our public discourse? Uh, It's hard to see how the truthers or the birthers have done anything healthy uh, for our uh, political process. Certainly the notion of questioning and of not taking things at face value is a good thing. Um, uh, So I think people should ask, are they getting the whole story? Uh, When people start uh, substituting an entirely new story made of whole cloth, uh, and then looking for facts to support that, well, that's not that's not helping things. But the long history of conspiracy theories does give us a window into the fears of our country at different points of time. I spoke with University of Miami professor Joseph Yuzinski, who recently published a huge research book on conspiracy theory in the United States. I think many people look at conspiracy theories as if they're a sign of pathology or mental illness and they're quick to brand people as crazies or paranoids, and it's not necessarily the case. If you really look at conspiracy theories over time, you start to see a few patterns. One of those patterns is that there tends to be a clear correlation between the type of theories we see and the particular political party who holds the White House. Yuzinski and other researchers found this by poring through more than 100,000 letters to the editor that had been written throughout American history, 
And what they found was that most outrageous claims weren't just random. They represented an extreme counter-response to the person or the party in leadership. If you think about that for a minute, what it's really telling us is that conspiracy theories are a tool used by those out of power to try and draw attention to the actions of those who are in power. And it makes conspiracy theorizing very rational. This language of conspiracy and the instinct to use it as a tool appears throughout U.S. history even as far back as some of our country's earliest documents. The Declaration of Independence is itself a conspiracy theory. You see this beautiful rhetorical language in the first few paragraphs of the Declaration, then when you get to the end, it's this litany of conspiracy charges against the King of England, most of which were completely made up. I mean, the King was not attempting to um, instill a tyranny over the colonies. Um, that was just conspiracy talk, and it, you, it was used to rile up the colonists. If you get to the end of the 1800s and the uh, early 20th century, you find uh, a lot of conspiracy theories about the big businesses, the monopolists. And then 50 years after that, you have a very large scare um, of, uh, about communists and communism. Presidential deaths in particular, of course, are their own curious and robust breeding grounds for conspiracy. And Yuzinski says this is not surprising, given that these figures are the embodiment of government power. Everyone knows who that is, and when they die in office, there's going to be some, some conspiracy talk. But interestingly, looking back in history, I mean, you, JFK dies, it's a conspiracy. We have yet to really identify who the other conspirators are. Lincoln dies, you rarely hear the word conspiracy. You usually hear, oh, this one guy, John Wilkes Booth, killed Lincoln because he was mad about slavery. Shot him in the head, and that was the end of it. If you dig a little bit deeper, what you found was that, you know, the killing of Lincoln was indeed a larger conspiracy. But you rarely hear um, the conspiracy term being put to it. At certain points in the 1990s, more than 80% of Americans believed that there was a conspiracy behind JFK's death. Today, it's more like 60%, but that's still a pretty remarkably high number. Um, there is an interesting argument that's out there made by some conspiracy theorists that the term conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorists were created by the CIA um, in the wake of the JFK assassination to shut down any discussion of the president's assassination. So... It may, so essentially what they did was turn the word conspiracy theory into a conspiracy theory itself. I don't know how much truth there is to that. I think that the term existed before that, but wasn't necessarily in that, that wide of use as it is today. Zachary Taylor, well, there's certainly not the same immense public fascination and skepticism about his death that there has been for JFK's. But it is perhaps the only reason people have heard his name in the past few decades. I think if you had asked me to list uh, uh, another accomplishment of Zachary Taylor, you might have stumped me. So uh, uh, he didn't get his uh, face on any currency, but he's gotten us to talk about him all this time later. Well done. Maybe ultimately the more interesting and less solvable question about Zachary Taylor is if he hadn't died, and if Millard Fillmore hadn't stepped into the presidency, would we have a different path toward or away from civil war? We'll keep thinking about that question on next week's episode of Presidential. Many thanks to this week's guests, Catherine Clinton, Joseph Yuzinski, and Dana Milbank. Original music for the podcast is by Dave Westner, and production help for this episode is by Karen Turner. Thanks again for listening, and we will be back next week. <laughs>